thank the Lord for the privilege of sharing another way of truth broadcast with you. This broadcast service originates in the radio studios of the Church of God in Hagerstown, Maryland, United States of America. This is Alvin A. Craig speaking. We're certainly thankful that you are tuned our way, and we invite you to stay with us as we bring you the gospel on today's Way of Truth broadcast. Someone has quoted Jesus in regard to our forgiving someone seven times. And Jesus said, not seven times, but seventy times seven. And some are using that statement to support the idea that Christians sin every day. But the Lord forgives them. But the Bible does not teach any such doctrine as that. And Jesus' statement does not support that kind of doctrine or that kind of teaching. So I'd like for you to consider with me the thought of Christians living a life free from sin. After all, the Hebrew writer tells us, without holiness no man shall see the Lord. That's Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. Now, I am not saying that Christians are above making mistakes, nor am I saying it is impossible for a Christian to fall away and return to a life of sin. The Bible teaching in regard to sin is that Christians do not commit any known sin. God holds us responsible for what we know, not for what we do not know. Now, the Old Covenant does speak of unknown sin. In fact, the people of the Old Covenant time were to offer a sacrifice for such. But the New Covenant does not teach that. Imputed sin involves a person's will. You either commit an act that you know you should not, and you know that it is wrong, or you fail to do something you know you should do, and you do not do it. Either way, it involves your will. So whenever we speak about a Christian living a life free from sin, we're talking about him not doing anything that he knows to be wrong, that God would not impute it to him if he did it not knowing. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute sin. And that person is one who is walking in all the light he has, obeying all the truth that he knows. Again, God holds us responsible for what we know, not for what we do not know. So let us start with Adam and Eve. God gave them one command, and if they disobeyed it, God said it would bring death, death to the soul. In other words, they were to live without committing sin. If they sinned, they would die. They would no longer be a child of God. The same is true today. One known sin produces death. The wages of sin is death, so Paul said in Romans 6 and 23. Next, let us look at Moses. He was up on the mount for 40 days, and while he was there, the people influenced Aaron to make an idol, and the people began to worship it and to conduct themselves in an ungodly manner. And the Lord told Moses to go down from the mount. And when Moses got close enough to see what was going on, he was made very angry with the people. He broke the two tables of stone where God had written the Ten Commandments. Later, Moses sought the Lord to forgive the people of their sins. And he said, if you would not, then blot my name out of your book. The Lord replied to Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Exodus chapter 32 
and 33. Notice those words of the Lord. Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. You get your name in the Lamb's book of life by being born again. And you keep it there by living a sinless life. You knowingly sin, and God blots it out. That does not, that does away with the idea, the false doctrine, that once saved, always saved. For if your name is blotted out of the Lamb's book of life, you are no longer a child of God. The psalmist said in Psalm 66 and 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. We also read in the Scriptures, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Those who commit sin, in other words, for sin is evil, and evil deeds are sin. Isaiah the prophet said, A highway shall be there, a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean, that is the unsaved, shall not pass over it. In other words, the unsaved are not on the highway of holiness, because the highway of holiness is for the redeemed. Isaiah said, the redeemed shall walk there. And to be redeemed means you have been saved from your sins. You find these scriptures in Isaiah chapter 35, verses 8 and 9. Ezekiel said, If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Ezekiel 33:15. Now let us look at what Ezekiel said. If the wicked, if the sinner, restore the pledge, give again that he hath robbed, walk in the statutes of life. And the only way that you can walk in the statutes of life is by being saved, by being converted. And if you walk in the statutes of life without committing sin, without committing iniquity, then you shall surely live. And if you do not walk in the statutes of life, and if you do not live without committing iniquity, then you shall not uh, live, you shall die. So Ezekiel said, If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he hath robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Also, Ezekiel said, When the righteous turneth from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, committeth sin, he shall even die thereby. Ezekiel 33 and 18. And that is proof that a person can backslide, that they can lose spiritual life. When the righteous turneth from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, he shall even die thereby. Ezekiel goes on to tell us that none of his righteousness shall be remembered. All the reward that you have laid up in heaven by living a Christian life for a period of time is lost if you turn away from God and commit iniquity. None of your righteousness shall be remembered, Ezekiel said. So this is proof that a person can backslide. Now Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. You do not have a pure heart if sin is there. Jesus said to the man that he healed at the pool of Bethsaida, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. John chapter 5 and verse 14. Jesus did not require something of this man that was impossible. If the man had to sin and he couldn't help himself, Jesus did not do him a favor by healing him. 
for he was going to bring a worse thing on him than what he had before. So when Jesus told him to go and to sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon him, Jesus was not requiring of him anything that was impossible. Jesus also told the woman that was caught in the act of adultery and brought to him by other men to tempt Jesus, and he told them, they that were without sin should cast the first stone. And all of them went out. And Jesus asked the woman, Where are thine accusers? And she said, No man. And he said, Neither do I condemn thee. What he was saying was, He did not condemn her to be stoned to death. He was not putting his approval upon sin. But he did say to her, Go and sin no more. And so he did not require of her anything that was impossible. But he did tell her, go and sin no more. Jesus also said, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. John Chapter 8, verses 34 through 36. Now, beloved, whenever God, the Son of God, makes you free, He makes you free from sin. And the same power that makes you free from sin is able to keep you from sin. Yes, what the gospel requires, the gospel gives grace to do. Now, Paul asked two questions. In Romans chapter 6. And then he answered them with another question. Note what he said. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Romans chapter 6 verses 1 and 2. Paul also said in this sixth chapter of Romans, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. That's Romans 6, verses 14 and 15. And that is the second time in this chapter that Paul says God forbids us to live in sin. The Apostle John said, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever abideth in him, that is in Christ, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children... Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, doth not commit sin. For his seed, that is his word, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. That is, he cannot sin as long as the word of God abides in his heart. The psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. John was not saying that it was impossible for a person to sin, but he was saying as long as the Word of God abides in your heart, as long as Christ is ruling your life, you will not commit sin. You will not live in sin. In this the children of God are manifest, John goes on to say. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. First John chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. John is saying the way 
you know the difference between Christians and sinners is that the Christian does not sin and the sinner does. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. 1 John chapter 3, verses 6 through 10 that I have just read. John is saying the way you know the difference, I say, between a Christian and a sinner is the children of God, the Christian, does not sin, and the sinner does. Again, there is nothing in Jesus' instructions for us to forgive someone that sins or does wrong against us and sincerely ask for our forgiveness. How sincere are those who sin every day and supposedly ask God to forgive them? True repentance comes as a result of godly sorrow. Notice what Paul said in Second Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Jesus taught us, as recorded by Luke, that we must repent or else perish. Do you suppose those at 18 that the tower of Siloam fell on were more wicked than others? Nay, I say unto you, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Do you suppose those that Herod mixed their blood and sacrifices uh, with animals, do you suppose they were more wicked than others? Nay, I say unto you, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And the apostle Peter tells us in Acts chapter 4, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. To repent to with godly sorrow produces salvation not to be repented of. And beloved, conversion means that you turn away from sin and you turn to God and you live a righteous and a godly life in this present world. For this is what the grace of God teaches us, and this is what the grace of God permits or provides us power to do. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll bless these thoughts to our precious congregation today. May the word of God, which we have endeavored to bring to them, be a blessing and a benefit to souls. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.